Imagine we could empty the oceans, draining all their water to reveal the secrets of the ocean floor. What could we possibly find? Today, we're draining the waters of the Pacific Ocean, and I don't want to spoil the surprise, but I can tell you that what awaits us is shocking live volcanoes, ancient civilizations, and colossal cliffs twice the size of the Grand Canyon. Our exploration begins off the west coast of the United States. You didn't come here to surf. Instead, you'll be exploring a terrifying underwater phenomenon known as the Ring of Fire. The Ring of Fire is not only the name of a very fun Johnny Cash song, it's also the planet's largest and most dangerous seismic zone. It's about 25,000 miles long and hosts around 800 volcanoes. Around 90% of all earthquakes happen in the Ring of Fire. The thing is, these earthquakes have the unique ability to also shake seabeds. So instead of just moving continental land, they also create great surges of water, meaning they cause significantly sized tsunamis. This is a big problem for us since over 500 million people live around the coast of the Pacific Ocean. Let's open the drain and see what's behind all of these natural disasters, shall we? Thanks to top-notch scanning technology and 3D imaging, we can actually recreate what lies hidden beneath surface waters. Here it is, located just 150 miles from cities such as Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver. A huge underwater mountain range made up of colossal cliffs, almost twice the height of the Grand Canyon. Some are tall enough to store six Empire State Buildings stacked on top of each other. It stretches for a staggering 700 miles along the coast. These cliffs look pretty harmless, but these are what geologists call a subduction zone. Hmm, sorry, what? A subduction zone is created when two tectonic plates are locked together in great tension. This tension is so big that it can create earthquakes of magnitudes 9.0 or higher. But what does that even mean? Let's review some basic geology. The core of our planet is a ball of iron surrounded by lava and a thick mantle of rock. This mantle is divided into what we call tectonic plates, but they aren't seamless. They've got cracks and they move around quite a bit, driven by the lava they are settled upon. If you've ever wondered how a mountain is formed, this is how, when two tectonic plates smash into each other. Sometimes one of them will get wrinkled and thrown upward, while the other is carved even deeper into Earth's mantle. When this happens, it creates a tense subduction zone. This sure is a cool discovery, but it's dangerous to the neighboring cities. Until recently, scientists believed that this structure had never collapsed during an earthquake. But your team has found some evidence that suggests otherwise. You've paired up with an expert underwater earthquake detective. Yes, there is such a thing. And dug core samples from the sea floor. These samples show us the behavior of this underwater mountain range for the past 2,000 years. And guess what? The samples show that somewhere around 1700 CE, a tragic event happened, an earthquake of a 9.0 in magnitude. If it were today, it would highly affect the cities built near the coast. Before you leave, you find another piece of bad news. According to the samples, earthquakes like these are bound to happen every 400 years. If that is really true, well, then someone needs to come up with a very good plan in order to protect the west coast of the U.S. and Canada. As you find out, this is not the only scary underwater formation that can cause tsunamis. The so-called Kaikoura Canyon in New Zealand also gives scientists something to talk about. Located less than a mile from the shore, researchers think this formation had something to do with the magnitude 7.8 earthquake that hit New Zealand back in 2016. You make a pit stop on the island to drain the waters right off the coast, and you see the colossal structure that's giving people the chills. The Kaikoura Canyon stretches for over 37 miles and forms one of the deepest sea channels in the world. The walls nosedive sharply on a depth of over 6,000 feet. For comparison, this equals three Burj Khalifa buildings stacked on top of each other. Trust me, it's pretty deep. In case this tectonic plate ever wishes to move around, it will probably cause a very devastating tsunami. But let's not think of worst case scenarios, huh? Moving on, you visit the island of Japan. You've come to check out the buzz around a forgotten underwater city. You catch a boat to the Ryukyu Islands, just off the coast. Three, two, one, and we pull the plug to drain the Pacific waters in the region. It doesn't take long before you start seeing a huge structure. At first, it looks like the ruins of Machu Picchu, located all the way across the globe in Peru. As you approach it, you slowly figure out its forms, a pyramid-shaped structure. 
arches, staircases. It's something that could have easily been a palace or castle. Could this also be a sign of human activity? What you've just seen is known today as the Yonaguni Monument. It also goes by the name of Japan's Atlantis. The entire monument is about the size of five football fields in the height of a five-story building. Its most surprising feature is its expansive terraces, which could have hosted large gatherings. Explorers and scientists believe that Yonaguni dates back 10,000 years ago. But whether it is a human-made structure or a natural formation is still under debate. For Japan's top marine geologist, Professor Masaki Kimura, Yonaguni is the heritage of lost civilization. Kimura has dived to explore the ruins over 100 times over the past 10 years. According to him, there are clear signs of human activity down there. The triangular pool located on the monument is a triangular-shaped concave that is the historical symbol of water fountains in the region. There is also a giant turtle carved on the eastern side of the structure. And according to Kimura, turtles have an important cultural meaning. Several pieces of stone tools have been recovered from the site. However, not all scientists support this idea. For many, Yonaguni is the result of thousands of years of erosion. The fact that the monument is composed of one massive rock leads them to believe it's not human-made. The defined edges and flat surfaces resemble a natural formation occurrence in Northern Ireland known as the Giant's Causeway. A series of interlocking basalt columns looking like the ruins of a palace, but they were the result of volcanic activity in the region. Well, it's not up for you to decide, so you keep on moving. As you're about to leave the island, a scientist calls you and asks you for your help. There's a mysterious underwater hole 44 miles off the coast of Tokyo that needs some attention. You pull the drain plug to check it out. As the water recedes, it reveals a large underwater plateau. At its center, there's the hole you need. It turns out to be the vent of an underwater volcano. Thousands of years ago, it probably had a towering cone. But it has been worn down by erosion and the movement of waves and has remained hidden over many years. To figure out if the volcano is dormant or not, you decide to check its temperature with the help of a submarine thermometer. Shocking news, the volcano is active. The news might be exciting at first, but we're talking about an underwater volcano very close to the coast of one of the world's most densely populated cities, Tokyo. No actual threats have been identified so far, but scientists promise to come back every few months in order to monitor its activities. Phew, I'll tell you one thing, there are a lot of scarier things than sharks lurking beneath the waters of the ocean. Is it possible to put out the sun? For example, what would happen if we poured all of the Earth's oceans on it? Or even more water? Well, let's find out. The universe is a place full of mysteries. Since ancient times, scientists have been arguing about how space works. But none of us has ever doubted the existence of one thing, the sun. Ah, the center of our solar system. It's big, bright, and immortal? Nah, not really. Actually, the sun is just an ordinary star. It consists of 75% hydrogen, a little helium, and a pinch of other heavy elements. Gravity holds it all together. But in around 5 billion years, the life cycle of the sun will come to an end. The hydrogen inside it will run out. Our star will begin to grow gradually. And you can't even imagine just how big it will become. And then it will start eating all the nearby planets. That's when we'll regret being so close to it. After eating us all, the star will remain a red giant for another billion years or so. And then, sooner or later, it will begin to shrink and fade, turning into a white dwarf. In the end, nothing will remain of it but a bright and colorful planetary nebula. But don't get scared. Right now, the sun is in the middle of its life cycle. It was born about 4.5 billion years ago, and about the same amount of time remains. Fortunately, we were born during the star's best and most stable period. In other words, there's no reason to worry. So let's find one. How about speeding up the sun's life cycle with the help of water? We'll try to collect all the water on Earth and pour it onto the sun. First, we'll need a bucket. No, not this one. We'll need a really, really big bucket. The one that can contain around 326 million cubic miles of water. It will be equal in size to the distance from Washington to Chicago. 
Or if we can only find ordinary buckets, there should be around 70 quintillion of them. This is a number with 18 zeros. Okay, imagine that we magically got that many buckets. It's time to put out the sun. We splash the star with all this water and nothing? Seriously? Oh, just look at this. The sun has probably felt sorry for us and produced one little solar flare. It turns out that all water on Earth is actually just a pathetic drop for the sun. People often underestimate how much bigger the sun really is than our planet. In reality, it can fit more than 1,003,000 Earths. So yes, the sun won't go out or even get colder. It won't even notice that we've done something. But let's not give up. We really want the sun to go out for some reason. What happens if we pour just enough water on it? And how much is this enough? Remember our quintillions of buckets? Well, we actually need about 370 octillions of them. This number has 27 zeros. It's hard to even imagine, so let's just say that it's a lot of water. Now, let's splash it all over the sun again. Wow, just look at the steam! But the sun hasn't gone out again. On the contrary, it said thank you and suddenly became much bigger and brighter. What's happening? You see, the sun isn't actually a campfire. Inside bonfires, candle flames, there's a chemical combustion. When we pour water on the fire, the water absorbs the heat of the flame and cools it to such an extent that it can no longer maintain the burning reaction. It also blocks the fire's access to oxygen. Water basically stops the chemical process. But the burning of the sun isn't the same reaction. Even though we say it burns, it's not entirely true. What happens there is called nuclear fusion. It's one of the most violent and craziest reactions in the universe. There are many layers of hydrogen going deep into the sun. If you take four hydrogen atoms and ram them together, you're left with an atom of helium. When we talk about the sun, the process is a little more complicated. When the star tries to carry out that fusion, positive protons repel each other. It takes a lot of force and energy to somehow squeeze them together. Fortunately, there's a magical force in space. It's gravity. The sun takes up 99.8% of all the mass of the solar system. Pretty heavy, right? And all this mass is what holds the sun together with the help of an incredible gravitational force. So, gravity takes quadrillions of these little hydrogen atoms and pushes them together every second of every day. And when they collide, they release some energy. So, unlike fire, the sun doesn't need oxygen to live. It needs hydrogen. And we all know that water is H2O. It consists of hydrogen and oxygen. So this is literally fuel for the sun. It's like trying to put out a fire with gasoline. More importantly, the extra mass added by water will make the sun heavier. Now, gravity says, thank you for your help. And then it starts to collide protons with each other even faster. And thanks to this, the synthesis speeds up. Great, we've made the sun incredibly strong, and now it has eaten us, along with other nearby planets. And if we keep adding water, the sun will sooner or later collapse in on itself. It will blow off its outer layers and become a black hole. Awesome. Now it will pull inside absolutely everything around. Good job, guys. Let's press rewind because clearly our water experiment was a mistake. One small solar flare sounds much better. All right, we're back to our usual calm sun. But it seems like there's something that we've forgotten. Well, apparently water was critically important for life on Earth. Who would have thought? Now there's a huge amount of unmoving fish and other marine creatures lying around where the oceans used to be. Poor things. As for deep sea creatures, they simply didn't withstand such a sharp change in pressure. Algae and corals have also dried up. Wait a minute, weren't they responsible for producing 50 to 80% of the world's oxygen? Oops, it's time to put on some oxygen masks. And how are things on dry land? I mean, now everything is just land. But you get the point. Wow, this whole place is lit, and I mean it literally. If there are no oceans, then there are no clouds or rain. Now there are forest fires everywhere. Poor animals have to escape and leave their homes. Oh my. 
And it's not like they'll be able to find a new home, because all plants, of course, will dry up quickly. There will be literally no place for living left on the planet. So now, Earth looks like a giant desert. Great! But people have been living in deserts for thousands of years, right? Maybe they'll know what to do. They won't. After all, people in the desert also need to drink. So now there's total chaos everywhere and survivors fight for the last drops of water. If there are any survivors at all. In fact, no matter how much they fight for resources, their fate is sealed. The ocean absorbs a huge amount of CO2 and the heat coming from the sun. They also distribute this heat throughout the planet, making it pleasant to live on. But once they're gone, the temperatures will quickly jump to 250 degrees Fahrenheit and above. But even if we forget about the high temperatures, now we have no clouds and they helped us too, by not letting through solar radiation. So we're also under the direct impact of the sun's rays. Our last hope is icebergs. Now that everything is terribly hot, they've melted. And maybe they'll be the last hope for humanity. But that cool solar flare was definitely worth it. Silly humans. Here on our good old planet Earth, water is literally everywhere. Not only in the oceans and seas, but also in the atmosphere, in the ground, and even in ourselves. It covers as much as 71% of the surface of our planet. Looks like our planet should have been called water and not Earth. But what would happen if water and land were distributed equally? What if half of the planet became land and the other half was water? Well, let's find out. First of all, let's discuss what we mean by equally. Despite all the things mentioned earlier, there's actually not so much water on our planet. Yeah, if you collected it all in one giant drop, it'd be slightly larger than the United States in size. And all this amount of water would only be 0.02% of the total mass of Earth. So, it turns out that all these horrifying unexplored ocean depths are basically nothing. And now, just imagine if we changed the composition of our planet by leveling the volume of water and land. What would happen then? Then we'd get a very creepy ocean planet. The planet would look like one boundless ocean. It'd be very unlikely that you'd find even a couple of small islands on it. And if you did find them, they'd probably be the tops of huge underwater mountains. This world would be practically uninhabitable. If you were on its surface, you wouldn't be able to see the sun or anything else in the sky. You wouldn't know what time of day it is or where exactly you are all because of the incredibly thick fog and clouds. This kind of weather would be permanent on such a planet. Moreover, you wouldn't even understand where the fog ends and the water begins, all because the humidity would be that high. But could there still be life? Well, maybe inside the ocean itself? Unfortunately, this is also quite unlikely. You see, to get to the bottom of this ocean, you'd have to swim vertically down, not for several hours, but for several days. And even after such a journey, you wouldn't see the bottom yet. The ocean wouldn't be bottomless, of course, but the seabed would consist mainly of very hard, impenetrable ice. But not the kind of ice we're used to. This ice would be exotic. There are different types of it, called ice 5, ice 6, and so on. Usually, these types of ice aren't as cold as regular ice and may not melt even at high temperatures. And there would be almost no algae or anything like that. So fish would simply have nothing to eat. That's why if life appeared on such a planet, it would be a miracle. This life would have to withstand a pressure of more than 20,000 Earth atmospheres. Even the most horrifying monsters from the Mariana Trench would be nothing in comparison to the creatures you'd find on this ocean planet. But could we, humans, live there? Well, theoretically, yes, but it would be extremely hard. We could create something like giant underwater stations, but we would still have thousands of problems. Where to get food and other resources, how to repair stuff, and so on. So it would be far from the best option. Okay, now we know that an ocean planet doesn't sound too endearing. What about another option? What would happen if the surface of the Earth was 50% water and 50% land? For this to happen, we'd need to reduce the current amount of water from 71 to 50%. In this case, the sea level would drop by about 2 miles, and a quarter of our planet would become dry land. Although it doesn't sound like much, 
the consequences would be disastrous. Right now, there are five interconnected oceans on Earth – Atlantic, Indian, Pacific, Southern, and Arctic. But if we lowered the sea level, all these oceans would simply disappear. they turn into separate closed reservoirs and seas. On the contrary, all the continents would merge into one giant landmass, almost as if we swapped the land and water. At first, it would seem pretty cool. Now, you could literally walk around the world. However, the amount of land you'd have to travel would also increase. Every continent on the planet would grow in size. All this new territory would be approximately equal to the current area of Asia, Europe, Africa, and North America combined. Well, that would be a huge mass of unused space. But what would we find on these new territories? Most of them would be pretty flat. But in places where there used to be deep oceans, you would see vast corridors and steep crevices. Now, here's another cool thing. Most of the sunken cities would return to the surface. And no, unfortunately, we wouldn't find Atlantis among them. But there would still be a lot of other cool places. For example, the ancient Roman city of Baia, which, according to legends, was basically a paradise on Earth with all its luxurious villas and gardens. Or Heraklion, the city that went under the sea thousands of years ago and was considered a myth for a long time. So yeah, we could organize tours to these ancient places. But of course, not everything would be fun and games in such a world. Due to a severe loss of water, ocean currents would be disrupted, and this would lead to very serious climate problems. The ocean absorbs the heat radiated by the sun. Thanks to the currents, this heat is distributed all over Earth, which creates a stable and pleasant climate. But if these currents were disrupted, then the temperatures on Earth would become more extreme. It would get much hotter near the equator and even colder around the North and South Poles. So yeah, unfortunately, the Antarctic ice wouldn't save us. It would be quite the opposite. The regions around the North and South Poles would completely dry out, basically turning into dry, cold deserts. In addition to heat, water also absorbs carbon dioxide from the air. And since the oceans wouldn't be able to absorb it, this gas would begin to accumulate in the atmosphere. This poisonous excess would cover the entire planet. The average temperatures would increase, and the whole planet would start to dry out slowly. Massive forest fires would break out, and so on. Hmm, sound familiar? Now, to make matters worse, there would be nothing to extinguish these fires, because, you know, rains can't form from nothing. So yeah, the precipitation levels would fall, and this would lead to dangerous droughts. We'd get a bunch of new deserts on all the continents. Despite getting all those new territories, it's unlikely that we could somehow build new cities and towns there. Many of these territories would be uninhabitable, not only because many forests and plants would disappear, but also because most animals would migrate to more pleasant places. As a result, we would have great difficulty finding any food at all. So all life on our planet, plants, animals, and people would have to adapt to new living conditions. They would have to evolve quickly and get used to the constant shortage of water. Animals, for example, could shrink in size because of this. Many of them, due to the lack of grass and moisture, would switch to a strictly carnivorous diet. And of course, we would have to say goodbye to the huge abundance of marine life. Many fish would disappear forever. Humans, most likely, would make a big evolutionary step backward. Not only because we would lose a large number of resources and move to new territories, but also because we would also lose access to one of the most important sources of energy in the world, hydroelectric power. Without electricity, many factories would stop working. To say that this would cause a large-scale crisis for us all is sadly obvious. So our current ratio of water and land is the best possible option. If there was too little or too much water, the consequences would be awful. That's why we need to protect the current conditions with all of our might.